What I'd like to do next is to shift over and do a, pre a, a brief introduction of my, uh, our colleague, Dr. Don, uh, Professor Don Sadaway. Um, Professor Sadaway is going to talk about electrochemistry and non-aqueous media. Now, uh, you know, just if, as looking at his bio, I, I would read through and just say that he's, his, his work or applied research in environmentally sound electromechanical extraction and recycling of metals, lithium poly solid polymer electrolyte batteries, advanced materials for use of, as electrode separators and walls, infused salt electrolysis cells and batteries. This is the stuff we often think of. This is the kind of work that happens at MIT. One of the things I think that Professor Sadaway has done is he, he's made this very relevant to the real world that we live in, and I think it's very exciting. And I'm not the only one who would say as such. Recently, he started up a business called Ambry, which is focused on energy storage, particularly in liquid metal batteries. Uh, it has been featured on the Colbert Report, which I, I still think he did a fantastic job. You know, Stephen Colbert really gives you a couple of rabbit punches out there, and he did a super job. I invite you to go look at it on YouTube. So um, I think that we're going to be a very interested to hear the comments of our colleague here, and one of the exciting things he calls it is, uh, extreme electrochemistry. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Don Sadaway. And you may give him some applause, all right? This is just like uh, a typical classroom, almost nobody in the front. <laughs> so uh, nothing's changed, I guess. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about something that is uh, different, but uh, in some ways relevant. Um, so I gave you this, uh, the title, a uh, sustainable energy generation distribution, which will get into the supply chain. And there's a security piece here as well. So um, uh, let me begin with this uh, image, which um, uh, is a a NASA collage, you realize this is not the, the world at night. You know, when it's, when it's dark here, it's light over here. You know, it, <laughs> that, that, that's... But a lot of audiences look at this, they, no, no, that's a NASA an image, that's the image at night. No, it isn't. If the world ever looks like this, it's a really bad day. <laughs> uh, but um, the reason that I'm passionate about uh, energy is that uh, I, I truly believe that the, the number one uh, invention of the 20th century was uh, electricity. And, and electricity paves the way for the 21st century. Everything that you value, you cannot have without electricity. And if you look at this uh, collage, you'll see that um, where there is light, that's where there's uh, human activity. And where there is no light is only one of two reasons. Either nobody lives there or it hasn't been electrified yet. And two out of seven people on the planet don't have access to electricity, ready access. Which makes me wonder about uh, MOOCs because the, you know, people talk about the, this uh, heartwarming story of a, of a child in Africa who can get access to an MIT education and so on. It's, it's a fairy tale because there's no electricity there. So without electricity, I give you a cell phone and the number one problem is I gotta go 30 kilometers away to a charging station and even then the cell tower is only running maybe an hour a day. So, you know, without electricity you don't have anything. So that's the number one supply chain that we have to deal with. And uh, if, if we want to bring electricity here and here, we don't need to wire it up to here. We could put photovoltaic arrays or wind turbines and have microgrids and so on, but the missing piece is storage. So that's why I work on storage. Now, you know, when I, when I first came here, I came from Canada 37 years ago, and I was a, a good boy that always painted in between the lines and so on postured to get tenure, and then after I got tenure, I said, okay, what are the big problems? What am I going to do about them? And um, this is what I've been working on. Um, so uh, let's talk about storage, because storage is really the critical piece here. And um, 
You know, if you want to talk about supply chain, you know, the electricity, power, and the lights in this auditorium was generated just moments ago. So let's go back to this, back to this image. Can you imagine that this entire supply chain has no inventory? The demand equals supply at all times. If we shut off the lights, then the generator has to reduce the output because if supply doesn't equal demand, the quality of the electricity is damaged. You know, you're banking that that's 110 volts at 60 hertz. And if it's 60 hertz plus or minus more than about a tenth of a percent, your devices will blow up. And, you know, if you're in Iraq or Afghanistan, the problem isn't that the electricity is intermittent. The problem is that when it's on, you don't know what the uh, frequency is. And can you imagine if every time you went to plug in your device, you didn't know, what is this, is this going to blow? And, you know, the device will blow in time to save the fuse. You can bet on that. <laughs> so, so imagine you've got this thing with no inventory. And I'm astonished. I, I run into all kinds of people that are um, involved in startups uh, in the storage energy space, and they have no idea of the complexity of electricity delivery. They, they talk about arbitrage. Yeah, if we had batteries, we could store energy in the night and sell it in the daytime. They don't even realize there is no, in many markets, there isn't even price differentiation. In Massachusetts, there isn't. There's no, there's no value in turning on your dishwasher at 2 a.m. because you get the same price no matter what. The, the complexity here is really, you know, load leveling, load following, frequency regulation, uh, transmission line deferral, all this stuff. And they have different electrical performance requirements, different time constants. Some are power heavy, some are energy heavy. It's really complicated, just so you can turn the lights on and you expect the lights to come on. So um, if we had storage, it's not just for renewables. We need storage on today's grid because today's grid is designed for peak load. Peak load, and peak load is typically about 40% greater than average, and we hit it about 1% of the time. That, that would mean if we wanted to build a highway, we'd build a highway that's 20 lanes wide. That means anybody in this room can go on the highway and never touch the brake pedal at any time. And you say, that's crazy. Or we start an airline, you and I start an airline, and for 360 days a year, 40% of our planes sit on the ground, and then the other five days are all up in the air because it's Thanksgiving and it's Christmas and we're going to meet peak demand. You say, that's a stupid business model. I say, well, that's the way the grid is. It has to meet peak. Now, uh, to electrify these parts of the world, the estimate is $17 trillion over the next 20 years. And if 40% of that is idle capacity, that's $7 trillion that could go into education, health care, and so on. So we, we need storage on the grid right now. We don't have it. It has no inventory. Imagine if every time you want to take a shower, it has to be raining because there's no such thing as a water tank. That's what we have. It's crazy. And renewables, I mean, renewables are not uh, a contributor to the grid because supply has to equal demand. So if the sun shines and we have regulations that say renewables get to the front of the line, so that means if I've got a coal-fired plant, nuclear plant, and somebody starts powering up photovoltaics, the photovoltaics get shipped first. That's, that's the supply chain. That means the, the coal-fired plant or the nuclear plant has to turn down. And we can handle, you know, several percent, but you start getting photovoltaics and wind up to around 15, 20 percent, those swings are devastating. Germany is in bad shape right now because they've got so much renewables. They, they uh, went very quickly at shutting down nuclear power plants after the Fukushima event. And um, the, 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 they don't have the storage, so they don't have the, any buffer. 
It's really tough. So without storage, they don't contribute to base load. And if they don't contribute to base load, they're, they're not a solution, they're a headache. And people haven't figured this out yet because it's just all this prattle about renewables. It wouldn't be so nice and so on. Yeah, it'd be nice, but it's incomplete. You've got to have storage. Otherwise, intermittency is, a, is really bad. And storage could massively reduce investment. I gave you one example, transmission line deferral. You know, there are places like um, Manhattan. The, the electricity demand in Manhattan keeps going up, 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 up because of the servers, the financial district. There's plenty of generating capacity in the New York area, but it's not on the island. And how do you get the electricity island? Transmission lines. And they're at a point now where very soon, maybe 2016, 2017, the capacity of transmission lines will be spent. And that means rolling brownouts, blackouts. And I don't think people are going to like that in Manhattan. So you say, well, why don't you just put in another transmission line? Well, a typical transmission line, the, the unit of cost is billions. And you know, our, our electricity market is really uh, uh, odd. If you and I formed an oil company, we could explore, drill, pump, refine, make product, and sell to the consumer in one integrated company. But in electricity markets, the people that generate it don't transmit it, and the people that transmit it don't sell to the rate payers. So when we need to build a new transmission line for a billion dollars, everybody just takes a giant step back. It's sort of like the, the check on the dinner table and everybody kind of, you know, he's going to get it, you know. But in the end, they don't care because what's going to happen if they have to put this thing in, first they're going to have trouble getting permitted because the public is scientifically illiterate and thinks that transmission lines are going to generate electromagnetic waves that are going to make our children into mutants and so on. Never mind, you see birds sitting on power lines all the time. I've never seen mutant birds, but you know, the public doesn't, <laughs> public doesn't understand that. So this could be a, a, a major obstacle. And uh, uh, there are markets such as Hawaii. On Kauai, for example, you know Hawaii has the highest uh, electricity uh, pricing in the United States. It's beautiful, it's got sun, it's got waves, it's got wind, and they import diesel. They burn diesel to generate electricity for 43 cents a kilowatt hour on Kauai. If you had batteries, you could put solar arrays on Kauai and the price would drop to 26 cents a kilowatt hour on day one without subsidy, without carbon taxes, without, without, without. So why aren't we doing something about this? And the security, you want to talk about security? You remember 2003, August, tree falls in Ohio and moments later 55 million people all over the Northeast United States and Canada are without power because the, the grid is right at the cusp. It's like, a, it's like a, a Ferrari, you know, you know why Ferrari has two seats, right? One's for the driver, the other one's for the mechanic. Because it's, it's so finely tuned, but it, it's very unforgiving. And so I've heard it said by people from various security agencies who will go unnamed, that uh, it would take no more than four bullets to take down the entire North American grid. Just substations that are visible from the street. And uh, there actually was an attack in Los Angeles in 2013. Somebody took down a substation and pfft, lots, lots of things going down. So if we could decentralize by having uh, solar arrays on your roof and batteries in your basement, that's good. That's really good. That's democratization of power, in this case, electrical power, but it, maybe there's a metaphor there. So I think I've made the case for storage, so why don't we have it? Well, it, it's, it's right here. This is a semi-log plot, so every time you go up one click, it's 10 times, and you can see that this is all below one-tenth of 1%, one so it amounts to nothing. So all the batteries don't do anything. 
The only thing that works in this market is pumped hydro, and pumped hydro is geographically constrained. You need a difference in elevation, and you need lots of water. So that's not going to work in Boston. It's not going to work in uh, Manhattan. not going to work in London. And even if you did have a difference in elevation, I bet you'd have a lot of trouble getting permitted today because people just don't have the appetite for putting up a big dam and messing with nature. Um, so that's not going to work. The other thing I learned from this graph is, and I had one of my students construct this, yeah, I just look at that and I say, I better get below $500 a kilowatt hour or I'm not going to have any impact. Clearly any of these aren't going to work. So where's the answer? The answer's here. See? The battery. The battery was invented by a professor at the university, Volta, in the late 1700s. There's his first battery, a stack of coins, silver and zinc, separated by cardboard soaked in brine. And immediately after Volta's invention, we had the birth of a new field, electrochemistry, and new technology, electroplating, electroforming, and that served as the basis for electrometallurgy once, once the dynamo was invented. So Volta's invention um, also, uh, and this is, eludes most people, it for the first time demonstrated the utility of a professor. You know, until Volta, nobody thought a professor could be of any use. But Volta showed that if you let a professor do research, he's liable to come up with something that's valuable. You just leave him alone. So, so this maybe is the template for modern sponsored research. In those days, everybody had to be an aristocrat, so he had his own money. But today, uh, if you give us some money, we'll do something. So... That's where it all begins, and, and now it continues. And I, I, I'm going to, to be a little bit uh, controversial, I'm going I'm to go out on a limb here and say I still believe that innovation is going to come from the university, more so than ever. 37 years ago when I came to this country, there were huge research labs at corporate centers. Steel, aluminum, chemicals, big labs. Now with the exception of East Cambridge here, where you still see international pharmaceutical companies doing research, the big corporate labs are gone. Look, look at what Jack Welch did to General Electric. Schenectady was the birthplace of modern material science, and now it's nothing. Because he went through and he, what was his motto? We don't need to invent, we can acquire. Well, if you propagate that lesson throughout the world, no one will invent. The only place you're going to see invention is at the university. So anyways, uh, back to the story. It's not battery versus battery. It's battery versus combustion. And, and when, when you're going to take an electrochemical device and go head to head with a liquid fuel, I mean, you know, this is David and Goliath, because liquid fuel is so energy intense. That's why we use it. But there's this environmental imperative, right? If it weren't for the environmental imperative, we'd just keep burning. And by the way, don't be charmed by the gigafactory. Today's lithium-ion batteries fail badly. They're way too costly. It's a 20-year-old technology. And so suppose, suppose the gigafactory gives you a 20 or 30% reduction in cost. That's not going to get you far enough to the left on that chart. And by the way, those batteries, uh, you know what their life cycle is like, right? Two years, two years later, you get a new phone, which is about the time that the batteries have run down. Isn't it charming that you don't realize how bad your batteries are because you get a new phone, you get a new computer. You know, as a, when I was a kid, we used to say, I'm going to trade in my Mercedes because the ashtray is full. You know? So what's my approach? Confine the chemistry to earth abundant elements because the scale is so enormous. It's not like iPhone. iPhone, there's many iPhones, but the total amount of material that goes into them is, doesn't disturb the market. Whereas if you go into grid level storage, you'll disturb the very thing you're trying to operate in. So you better operate with earth abundant elements. And this is a chart that's taken from a government publication um, and it's a log scale as, as well. This is the 
earth abundance as a function of atomic number. Now each element has its own number, so somebody connected the dots here. Now I don't know what, why you would connect lithium to beryllium, because there's no element with an atomic number of 3.4. There's either three or it's four. So you know, people use this expression, let's connect the dots. You shouldn't connect the dots. This should be a bar graph, but they connected them anyways. So you see, this is a thousand. That means the difference between these elements and these elements is one billion. One billion. So if you're going to build something for grid level storage, you better build it out of something up here. I refuse to allow my students to work in this part of the periodic table because it won't scale. You see platinum is down here. Now platinum's okay for the jewelry market because the size of the jewelry market is small enough that there's enough platinum. But fuel cell vehicles is nuts because fuel cells contain platinum electrodes and there isn't enough platinum. GE works on cadmium telluride solar cells. T tellurium is about as earth abundant as gold. Even if I gave it to you for free, figure out how many square meters you'd need of CAD telluride solar cells and how much tellurium is in the planet, it doesn't exist. It's, it's a non-starter. So why are people doing this? Why, does, why do people do research on these things? It, there's only one thing to do research on, non-noble metal catalyst. You need a catalyst that comes from here, otherwise you're wasting your time. The hydrogen doesn't grow on trees anyways. Oh, did I mention? To make hydrogen from water, you use platinum. So this is really stupid. The hydrogen economy. The hydrogen economy, really. I just need to look at this, and I can, this plus the periodic table, I can tell you the future. I can tell you, you know, it's just. So if you want to make something dirt cheap, make it out of dirt. And preferably local dirt. Because it doesn't make sense to change your dependence on imported petroleum for an uh, dependence on imported neodymium. Your dollars are leaving the country. You just, you just put a different destination on them and make it easy to manufacture. This is where lithium ion fails. The giga factory costs giga dollars, $5 billion. You know what I could build for $5 billion? I could build a greenfield integrated steelworks making 250,000 tons per year. The last integrated steelworks in the United States was built in 1961. This, this is like a semiconductor fab line instead of it should look like an automobile plant. So now let's go to uh, my story, uh, the liquid metal battery. So uh, when, I, when I started this about 10 years ago, uh, first, first rule was disregard everything you know about batteries. Look in the other direction, because batteries are built to be about this big. And you don't take something this big and multiply all the dimensions by a thousand and get a big battery. That doesn't work. Even Boeing learned that, you know, if you, if you take a lithium ion battery that's this big and make a lithium ion battery that's this big, you get not the dream liner, you get the flame liner. All right? So I looked at something that doesn't store electricity. I looked at something that consumes electricity, huge quantities of it. This is the aluminum smelter. And I know I'm spelling aluminium. That's the proper word. And by the way, Charles Martin Hall's patent in uh, 1886 has aluminium. That was the original name. Somewhere around the 1920s in the United States, we started going to the term aluminum. But I don't care. I, I spell it aluminium, and I say aluminum. Everybody's confused, but that's good. So you, you import bauxite from one corner of the globe, the carbon is petroleum coke. You need 13 kilowatt hours of electricity to make a kilogram of liquid aluminum and a $5,000 a ton capital cost, so 100,000 tons a year plant. You can figure out how much that's going to cost. And dirt to metal for 50 cents a pound. That's why we have aluminum beverage containers. They're, they're, they're cheap. And this is what the smelter looks like. This is about 50 feet and probably goes back about a mile. And uh, it was invented in 1886 simultaneously by two people working independently, Charles Martin Hall in the United States and Paul Hirule in France. 
There they are. They were both born in the same year. They both died in the same year. And they met once in 1911 when Hall was given the Perkins Medal by the American Chemical Society in recognition of his invention. And he ruled came from France to the banquet and spoke in praise of Hall. And they, they were fierce competitors. The, the patents ended up at the world court and were cross-licensed. But they respected each other. Not like today where people are stabbing each other in the back trying to win a Nobel Prize and so on. Well, they were both the same age in 1886, I guess, because they were both born in the same year. Guess how old they were in 1886? 22. Two 22-year-olds changed the world with this. Why? Just to re remind you, when they built the Washington Monument, they wanted to have it capped with something precious. It's a 100-ounce pyramid of aluminum because in 1876, aluminum cost more than silver. So there they are. Yeah. But thanks to Hall and he rule, the price of aluminum dropped to a, that of a common structural metal. Why? Because aluminum is the third most abundant element in the Earth's crust. If they'd invented this process for rhodium, it wouldn't have made any difference. See, so you need earth abundant elements in an easy process. Aluminum is more abundant than iron. And by the way, uh, we're really lucky that nature is kind because silicon is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust, and it's the premier semiconductor. And that's why we all have cell phones and computers and so on, because they're made out of sand. And what's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust? It's oxygen. And if you put silicon plus oxygen, you get fiber optics. And that's why fiber optics are coming, and they're going to be everywhere, and they're going to be cheap because they're made of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. If they were made out of platinum, you're not going to see them, maybe on a spaceship. See? So you just need this table. So now it's no longer a precious metal. It's a beer can. <laughs> so why is the aluminum cell not a battery? Maybe it is a battery. They just don't know it. Well, I studied this thing. I, that was my early work here at MIT. There's gas coming off one of the electrodes. So I realized that what I really need to do is to produce liquid metal at both electrodes. And that gave birth to this. And it, fortunately, we had some internal funding here at MIT. If I'd written this up in the form of a proposal, it would have been one of two outcomes. It would have gotten trashed or it would have gotten stolen. But I, I'm for sure I wouldn't have gotten the money. So I was able to do this. This is the first embodiment. It's the liquid metal battery. So there's magnesium on the top, molten salt, antimony on the bottom. Magnesium's insoluble in the salt, and the salt's insoluble in the antimony. So they segregate like salad oil and vinegar. This got a density less than two, this density greater than six, this is somewhere in between. So there's no membranes, no separators. It's self-organizing. And then when the thing discharges, the magnesium wants to alloy with antimony. And so what it'll do is uh, become a, oops, I'm going too fast here. The magnesium wants to alloy with antimony, so it becomes magnesium ion, sends electrons in the external circuit, and then this pool gets deeper and this one gets shallower. And then to recharge the battery, we electro-refine the magnesium back. So we purify the contents, we purify the magnesium, we purify the salt too. Everything gets purified. You, you hit the reset button. And the action of electric current generates heat. You know that when your battery's charging or discharging, it gets warm, and that's a threat to you. But here, I take that heat and I capture it, insulate, and, uh, and keep it at temperature. So it's easy to manufacture self-assembly. In fact, you just pour in the magnesium antimony alloy in the salt and then melt it and then generate the top layer. It's self-heating at commercial scale. The round-trip efficiency, you know, people, the, the energy area is really nasty. Instead of people welcoming you with bouquets of flowers and baskets of fruit, they're, they're all, you know, disparaging all the time. So if you read about me, they're saying, this is stupid. He's going to lose all of his energy just generating heat. Well, we lose some energy generating heat about 25% of it, which gives us a round-trip efficiency of 75%, which is greater than the round-trip efficiency of pumped hydro. So 
there. <laughs> Immune to thermal runaway. If, if you want to uh, use this as a load, you can dump huge currents through this and it'll get warm. We've actually done some shock tests where we, we plunge the magnesium into the antimony in one step. You get a huge exotherm. This temperature goes rising way, way up, but below the melting point of the container and below the boiling point of the content. So there's no, no damage done. It doesn't catch fire. In fact, I was once visited by a couple of people from DARPA, and they said, could you put one of these things on a forward operating base in Afghanistan? And I said, yeah. And they said, yeah, but what about, um, what happens if a sniper shoots bullets into it? I said, well, a bullet goes in here on alloy with a magnesium, it goes in here on alloy with antimony. I said, yeah, but now you got a hole, it's gonna, the metal's going to leak. I said, yeah, and it'll freeze. And they look at each other and they say, battle hardened. <laughs> so you see, a high temperature battery is safer than a room temperature battery. You can't ship lithium ion batteries by air. They come by ship, by truck, by train. It is illegal to put lithium ion batteries in cargo because they're dangerous. So we went to the Department of Transportation and said, what about this? And they said, well, what's the, what are the properties of the electrolyte and the metal at room temperature? Well, this is solid metal, this is solid salt. And they said, where you go. Can you imagine if a truck tips over on the highway with, full of lithium ion batteries? If this tips over, we need this in Boston anyways. We've had a terrible winter. We're going to need salt on the road. It's no problem. <laughs> so this is my team. This is 2007. One, one student. He was, he was also from Canada. We were both born in Toronto, different years. And uh, <laughs> so he, his primary degree was in physics. He didn't know any electrochemistry. He was young. He came, did a paper study, and we, we realized that this battery might have some uh, value, and then he stayed on and we got this internal funding. He looks pretty worried here. Uh, he's looking at this wondering if it's gonna work. And uh, what I didn't tell him was that I wasn't sure it was gonna work either. But the way you mentor is you tell him, you'll make it work, and he did. And then uh, the uh, American Chemical Society did a profile of me a couple of years ago and they asked for an image. So I sent them this image and they said, no, we won't publish that. I said, why not? They said, we will not publish an image showing people in a professional setting dressed unsafely. You're not wearing safety glasses. I said, but this is just a stage thing. It's nothing. And they said, no, 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 we don't, we don't show people unprofessionally. I said, why don't you just get out a Sharpie and put the thing on? And they said, no. So I had to get him another image. And then the MIT Energy Initiative was formed around 2008 or something like that. And they introduced me to the French energy company Total, which led to a $4 million grant. And then I was the first round ARPA-E winner. And that gave me $13 million. And this was my team in the summer of 2010, 20 people mix of graduates, undergraduates, postdocs, and that's the only one that was steeped in electrochemistry. They're bright, uh, they're at MIT, but they were not knowledgeable about batteries or electrochemistry. I taught them the electrochemistry and then I turned them loose and they worked miracles. And multinational, Spain, Korea, China, France, Trinidad, uh, Tahiti, he's uh, from uh, French Polynesia, PhD in high energy physics in Paris, ends up in my lab. Poland, David and I are from Canada, and I hired a few Americans. And uh, nice mix. Now, 20 people for three years, 20 times three is much greater than three times 20. If you gave me the same amount of money over 20 years, I wouldn't be standing here right now. There's a, there's a value in a, in a critical mass of people. And the first years were terrible. First years, the, we had visits from the Department of Energy, and we got yellow carded. Dave Danielson, who's now the Undersecretary of Energy, was our monitor. He came and he said, uh, after the third visit, he says, of all the projects in my portfolio, I give this the least 
chance of success. He walked out of the room. It was a hush. And then partway through year two, the stuff they started finding was unbelievable. Did you have to have the courage to, to wait through that? You know, you can't, if you want to teach the child how to drive, you don't say, sit and watch me. You've got to put them in the driver's seat and you have to endure the learning. So this is the, one of the cutaways. This is magnesium salt and anemone. Uh, Steve Chu is Secretary of Energy. This was June of 2012. That's Jocelyn, one of my students, uh, pointing out some things to him. And behind, I'm sorry, we got a, eclipsed a little bit of cell. One of my students, he was a uh, uh, first generation go to college, child of migrant farm workers in California, ends up at a community college. Teacher says to him, you know, I think you're capable of better. Gets to Berkeley, top of his class in physics, becomes a roommate of David Bradwell. Bradwell says, why don't you come and meet Sadaway? And he comes into my group, now he's a PhD in electrochemistry. Um, and we went down, Steve Chu autographed the glove box, and I made sure we wore glasses for this photograph. <laughs> so it's guilt-free. So we've tested over a thousand of these things, different combinations of salt and metal, and a number of them are below $100 a kilowatt hour for the electrodes and electrolyte. And uh, it's really good science, too. It, that's the odd, you know, people, when, when I first started working on batteries in the mid-90s, uh, I People at MIT would say, so what's, what's new? And I'd say, oh, I'm starting to work on batteries. And they'd look at me sort of, what? You know, isn't that kind of 19th century? I think of batteries as sort of the, you know, the Rodney Dangerfield, don't get no respect. But we're tethered in the wireless age because we don't have good batteries. And why don't we have good batteries? Because we're not spending enough money on the research. We don't, as Bill Gates says, the collective IQ isn't high enough. So, uh, I do publish, I don't care, tenure means never having to say you're sorry, so I don't need to publish, but my, I want to launch the careers of the young people who work with me. So uh, this was published uh, late uh, last fall in Nature, which is arguably the premier journal. Science is okay, but there's only one Nature. And this isn't Nature Communications or Nature Chemistry or Nature Materials, this is Nature. Why am I so proud of this? And I'm proud of the people here, that's what. And uh, uh, this was a, a new chemistry, lithium, antimony, lead, and uh, they wanted an image. And uh, so Felice Frankel made this for us. This is a Pyrex uh, square walled beaker, and this is mercury on the bottom. You can see the meniscus down. And then the electrolyte is uh, sodium chloride and water. This is room temperature, right? We couldn't do this at high temperature. And this would be the current collector for the lithium. So this would be the battery in a discharge state. You can see the meniscus on the um, electrolyte goes up and the meniscus here goes down. It's, it's pretty. There's even, there's even beauty here. Yeah. But this is the thing that makes me really excited is the stunningly low fade rates. This is a cell that's operating at 600 milliamps per square centimeter, which is about 50 times the current density of a, of a lithium ion battery. And this is the most severe stress test, 100% depth of discharge. So it's full charge to full discharge, full charge to full discharge. And this is the result, fade rate is this. What does that mean? It means that if you were to do this once a day, every day for 10 years, you'd retain 99.4% of the nameplate capacity. There's no battery that can come anywhere close to that. Now, the, the normal metric is how long does it take before you drop to 80%? So for a lithium ion battery, it's probably two years, right? For us, it's 305 years, which as I look around this room, ought to take care of pretty much everybody sitting here. So we started a company because we knew we had to, to for commercial scale, it had to be big and it had to have power electronics and all that stuff. So we called it Liquid Metal Battery Corporation. It wasn't a very sexy name. All the good ones were taken by 2010. And then a couple of years ago, we rebranded to Ambry because uh, we invented the battery in Cambridge. So Ambry is out of the heart of Cambridge. And it was a five-letter domain name, pronounceable, uh, still available, ambry.com. 
And the first funding came from Bill Gates. And uh, how did I meet Bill Gates? I'm Canadian. I'm too polite. I wouldn't approach Bill Gates. I was teaching a large freshman chemistry class at MIT. <clears throat> and uh, uh, there were three choices, two from the chemistry department and one from material science. And over the course of 16 years, I built up a market share of almost two-thirds of the freshman class. And the class was too big to fit in the room, so they started recording and, and then running the lectures on MIT TV. And then as the, as the bandwidth increased, they started posting them on the internet. And Bill started watching my lectures on MIT OpenCourseWare and eventually watched all 35 lectures. And so in uh, August of 2009, I got this uh, email from a woman representing herself as his administrative assistant saying he's coming to Boston at the end of September. Would I be willing to meet with him? <clears throat> well, I disregarded the email because <laughs> I thought the students had hacked into my email account. And she wrote me again, said perhaps she didn't see my email. And I said, well, maybe it's real. So he came. We sat for 90 minutes in my office, and we talked about engineering education, distance learning, computers, da da And we got on the topic of uh, batteries. And this was 2009, before any of the ARPA-E funding, any of the Total funding. I had nothing. David's early experiments were not successful. But I sketched some stuff on the whiteboard, and. At one point, he says to me, you know, if you ever decide to spin this out, uh, let me know. I'd be willing to put some money into it. And a year later, I approached him, and he was our first investor. And Total matched him. And uh, we now have uh, 45 people working. This is uh, November of 2013. We opened a manufacturing facility in Marlboro, about uh, 25 miles from here. This is Phil Judici, who's our uh, CEO. This is Deval Patrick, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. This woman is the uh, commander of the joint base on Cape Cod, where our first batteries will go next year. Uh, this was uh, part of the manufacturing. We, we had to do everything. <clears throat> we were visited by GE, Siemens, ABB, Schneider Electric, all of them. I said, why don't you help me? You know, I need the inverters. I need the power management system, battery, so on and so forth. And uh, they are just, wow, that's pretty risky. Let's keep in touch. So we had to do everything ourselves. And this was, we hired somebody who had worked in the automobile industry, worked with Ford, not building cars, but building the robots that build the cars. And this is a robotic device inside here. Something picks a can, puts the metal, puts the saw, TIG welds the top, and so on. 10 million, not 10 billion, $10 million, 130 megawatt hours per year comes out of that box. And that could go anywhere in the world. So that means that batteries in the United States are built in the United States, not in China. Batteries in Africa be built by Africans in Africa using African resources. That means they become the authors of their own future. And it's not just a, you know, where are you going to find the people? Because we've got the device. You put that in and train locals and away you go. So this is a... This is, these are four inch squares, and this is the kind of stuff that you can't do on campus. So you aggregate these things. This will give you 700 watt hours. A typical American home needs about 10 kilowatt hours. So there's two kilowatt hours, and a stack of that would give you uh, something about the size of a large refrigerator could put, put in your basement. So this is the stuff that's going on in Marble. This is 25 kilowatt hours. And that's about a meter, and you put 10 of those together, that's about the size of a shipping container. And then we need power electronics. These are just the batteries, but you know, it's like filling an ice cube tray. You, you've got to balance it. You can put them in the field if you want, or you can put them in the basement. This could go in the basement of a skyscraper in Manhattan. And 2 a.m. when the demand is low, you charge these up, and at 2 p.m. you pull them out of the basement, pull them like to, there's power electronics. We hired people for that, too. So this is two megawatt hours. So that's about a 53-foot uh, trailer on an 18-wheeler. So this is 
where we hope to be in about two years' time. It's silent. It's not like diesel genset. And it's emissions free, not like a diesel genset. No moving parts, like pumped hydro has, first word is pumped. I've talked to people about flow batteries. They say, oh yeah, the last 15 years. I said, um, the pumps. Oh yeah, the last 15 years. I mean, we have to replace the veins, and we have to replace things. Well, I, I, I used to have an Avanti. I mean, it was 40 years old, but not 40 years untouched. I mean, if you replace all the parts, you can keep a car on the road forever, right? It's remotely controlled. At one millisecond, it can turn from a source into a load. That means it can play in multiple markets. And it's designed to the price point of the electricity market. Not $250 a barrel oil, not $200 a ton. Carbon tax, not subsidies. Just get in there and invent the price point. So the first battery is way over here. But we have figured out that at scale, we can be below 500. If we're below 500 without constraints, we should be up here. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, what have I learned? What's, what's the meta story here? Um, everybody says you want a low temperature, keep it safe. I, I, I flew in the face of conventional wisdom and said, no, I want a high temperature because it's got more energy density. And everybody says, build a gigafactory. You're going to get the economy of scale by building more and more and more. I said, no, no, no. You get, you get economy by building fewer, make them big. Because, you know, when you, when you put 6,000 18650s, that's 18 millimeters in diameter, 65 millimeters tall, the batteries of a, a Tesla, if I gave them to you for free, you got 6,000 of those and you got to pot them into something and wire them. Wouldn't it make sense to have fewer? You, you know, they built, a, they built some lithium ion uh, containers in California. 83,000, 83,000 18650s. I, I do that with about 100 times fewer. And with human resources, go with the experts. Nope, that's not how you invent. You go with smart people, novices, and manner them and turn them loose. They surprise me. So this is what I tell my, uh, my people, uh, this is the battle cry from the barricades in Paris, 1968. Be realistic, ask for the impossible. And with enough ingenuity, the impossible becomes the inevitable. Thank you. So, questions. Now it's time for your questions. You notice I didn't say, are there any questions, because that's a bad way to begin, because there's two answers to that. Are there any questions? <laughs> if I really want to turn you off, watch this. Are there any questions? <laughs> See the body language? Everything is saying, no, there are no questions. Are there any questions? Manny, here you go. Let's have your questions. State your name. Uh, Manny from Intel. Yeah. Uh, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. How is this different from uh, Bloom Energy? I'm not familiar with it, but I was wondering. So Bloom Energy is a high temperature fuel cell. It's a solid oxide fuel cell. And so it operates at about 850 degrees Celsius. There's a solid um, ceramic membrane with platinum electrodes. And the idea is to uh, convert uh, some kind of fuel, whether it's natural gas or uh, methane, and so you feed fuel in, and uh, electricity comes out. And uh, uh, so it is a, it is a generating, uh, power generating device. So this, this operates at lower temperatures. The, right now we're operating at about 475, but we've got some new research on campus that uh, next generation alloys and materials that are operating at about 250. You get 250 degrees, that's, you don't even need a steel can, now it's a polymer can. And a round trip efficiency is about 90%, so on. Uh, Don, what are the next steps for the AMRI project? Well, the next steps, uh, there's, there's still some learning. 
Um, we, we have to be very careful. We've never done this before. There's all sorts of headaches involved in, in the scale up, things like seals and whatnot. And uh, so as we get uh, to the point where we're confident in the design, then we can put money into uh, expansion. So we've got early deployments. There's one in um, Cape Cod. There's one in uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, there's one on uh, one of the uh, other Hawaiian islands. And once we have the learning from that, that, that field experience, then we'll know how to step on the accelerator. Um, right now we're looking at uh, where the, the highest pain points are. So there is, there is a, a project with Con Edison in, uh, in New York um, because they've got the transmission line headache. Uh, in Hawaii, they've got the, the diesel headache. So we're looking for the, the, the places where the pain is highest, and that will allow us to sell at much, much higher prices than the $500 per kilowatt hour. And then as we get better and better, then hopefully we'll, we'll penetrate other other markets. But, uh, you know, the company's five years old. You know, five-year-old, how can you say five-year-old startup? It doesn't make sense. You know, if I was five years old in, in IT, I would have been out of the business already, you know? But in energy, five years is nothing. It'll take easily 10 years. New materials take typically 18 years to go from lab bench to market. And so we're, we're closer to that than IT. So th th this is the thing that makes the whole value proposition very, very rickety. Because you know, we talk about venture capital and, and investment and innovation and so on, but the, the, the time scale of venture capital and the expectations on return are very different from what's reality in the energy sector. So the, 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 it's an impedance mismatch here. And that means they say, well, we're different from other investors. No, you're not. You're, because the people that put money into your fund are expecting a, a return. And so you, you eventually lose patience. And then you know, after so many years, you come in and say, you guys are a bunch of coffee drinkers. You're fired. Let's, let's flip this thing. Let's get our exit. And, and then the technology dies. And you know, government, well, the government shouldn't, government should be funding, and this is my opinion, it's not a fact. In my opinion, the government should be funding breakthrough research on campus. The, we shouldn't be, we have, Ambry has zero government money. This is, this is true ARPA-E uh, to the model. Money on campus, innovation, private funding in the company. But is it going to last? People are just going to say, I quit. So the clock is ticking. And it ticks louder and louder each year. I can hear it. So a uh, question I had, actually, before I, I, I studied chemistry years ago, and I, I do not remember it being this interesting. So. <laughs> And that was probably my fault for not listening. No, you, like, you were probably, I, <laughs> let me interrupt you here. I, uh, in my judgment, chemistry is, is the worst taught of all of the basic subjects. I mean, even math is taught better than chemistry. Right. I, I've, and electrochemistry, <laughs> I think, is the most fascinating, and it is the most badly taught of all of the chemistry. So for me, my, my competition makes me look good. So right. don't beat yourself up. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm pleased I came. You made my day. Yeah, that's uh, what I do. So my, my question was whether, because of the, the, the way the battery's designed, yeah. is it possible for it to be operating in a mobile environment? Can the, can the batteries be operating in mobile at the same time? Not, not the way it is right now, because the, the liquid layers would uh, mix on acceleration. Um, but we have some next generation uh, ideas that might render it uh, mobile. Um, so that's why if I can get the temperature down to about 250, that's below the temperature inside your internal combustion engine. So that's not a threat. And uh, 
but right now we're, we're focused on uh, stationary. Uh, one, one big challenge at a time. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matt Carmel from Sill Energy. Uh, I have a question about kind of the long-term production cost. Um, I, I know you put out a $100 per kilowatt hour number. Yeah. What do you think the all-in production cost will be, say, in a few years from now? Well, at steady state, when, at steady state at scale, when we're, when we're operating, we would hope to be able to uh, get that cost below 500. I don't know. I don't know how low it'll go, but if we can get if we can get it out to uh, to market at 500, it'll it'll take off. I just don't know. There there are, there. Are, I'm not being cute. There there are some unknowns with respect to. Um, I'll give you a simple example. The inverters. You know, the battery is DC, but the grid is AC which makes me wonder why we don't build our buildings now with DC because everything you're using is DC and all these power bricks are converting AC to, to DC, but anyway. Uh, so if you got the two megawatt hours storing DC, you have to convert back to AC and you need a, a, an inverter. And an inverter that is uh, low voltage, high current is frightfully expensive. And I don't know if it's frightfully expensive simply because it's a low volume item or whether there's something intrinsic and no one will give me a straight answer. So th there are these things that we're going to learn. You know, we're, we're, at some level we're, we're building the plane as we fly it. And we're a long way from electrochemistry, by the way. This, the problems we have are not... The electrochemistry has never failed. In fact, it, it, it shocked me how good it is. I knew it was good, but I didn't know it was going to be that good. What other questions might you have? Are there any? <laughs> Don, hi. Robert Baton from Genentech. I was just curious. You talked about that first year and how hard it was mm. to protect what you'd built from skepticism and expectations. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you got through that year? Uh, what you did to protect the team. Um, Thank you. I guess it's, it's just, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, you, you get a sense of me. And it's just, it's my management style. Um, and uh, the, the, the way we chose our people, that they're, they're givers, not takers, they're collaborators. And uh, no, uh, uh, no humiliation. I have some some colleagues that are tyrants, and they they eviscerate their students. They they have group meetings, and when someone presents something that failed to meet expectations, they just uh, gut the person in public and people. You know, this it's really punitive kind of. So it it I think it comes from uh, uh, encouragement and. And of course, you know, I, there was some technical content that I gave as well. But um, yeah, it's 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 mysterious. People ask me this a lot, and I've, I've been trying to think: can I articulate what I did? And the same thing at the company. You know, there's 45 people there, and uh, I never have to put on a referee's jersey and blow a whistle. You know, they they just they have a higher sense of purpose, you know. So uh, hire well and mentor well and just get out of the way and, and, and encourage them. When they fail, we learn. We, we, when we fail, we don't humiliate, we don't judge, but we do learn. So we don't want to learn. We, we don't want to fail again doing the same thing again. But, um, yeah, it's just... Yeah, that's, that's it. Um, and, and the higher sense of purpose is really uh, gratifying to me because when I first started working on batteries, I had trouble getting students and postdocs. They all want to go into IT and to uh, uh, bio. And in materials, it's all nano, you know, graphene now. In those days, it was 
nanoparticles and whatnot. And I'm, I'm talking about batteries. This is like heavy metallurgy and look at that. So that's, I don't want that. But the people that do this, they, they want to change the world. So that's a higher sense of purpose. You know, so you think of President Kennedy's speech at Rice University in 1962, you know, we choose to work on grid level storage not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And that's what we get at MIT. You know, I, I have some students and I say, well, why'd you go into electrical engineering? You, you, like, you like circuits? What? No. Well, why'd you choose electrical engineering? Because I heard it was the hardest course. So where do you want to go? I want, which is the steepest hill? So you get people like that and turn them loose. Mentoring, I just, I just got to walk in and say, hey, how's, how's everybody doing? <laughs> that's, that's my job. Uh, thank you. Rob Fitzpatrick from NICTA, a technology research organisation in Australia. You started the uh, discussion talking about essentially disintermediating the power supply chains. Whenever you do something like that, there are incumbents who make a lot of money from the way the industry is currently structured. Yeah. Can you talk about the reactions that you're getting from the incumbents? Uh, there's no reaction. They, they, they want business as usual. Uh, they don't, I mean, th they don't believe this is going to work and so on. But ultimately, let's, let's assume success. We will align the interests. Because if, if I'm a big uh, generator and, and the population continues to grow, at some point, I'm going to have the capital expenditure of a new generating facility. With these batteries, I can defer building a new facility. So there are ways. And uh, there are, you know, depending on the market structure, um, in some places, there is vertical integration. But, you know, if, if you've got a disaggregate, right now, the people that are generating it don't, don't transmit, the people who transmit don't sell the rate payer. I come up with a battery. Who benefits best from that battery? And who is free? You know, in, in Italy, uh, they have a lot of solar in the south, and the heavy industry is in the north. And just north of Rome, there's a pinch point in the transmission. And so Terna, which is the, the, the national transmission uh, operator, the ISO, they wanted to install batteries that would allow them to capture energy. And they were blocked by the, the government-run uh, generator because the generator argued that you don't have the right to generate electricity. You only have the right to ship. And when the battery is turned on, it's effectively a generator. So. Somebody's got to get in there and say, what is the, what is the interest? But, but right now, you know, I, I've, I've been visited by a number of the big generators, and they just look at it, and they're, they're, they're noncommittal. But everybody's noncommittal. You know, the, bi the big electrical power companies are noncommittal. I'm saying, you know, you could build things here and sell and I would love to be able to say that, yeah, my battery's rickety and it's new, but you know the power supply is built by Siemens, but they're not interested. It's really bizarre. I, it must be some. I, you know, you asked me how I, what well, my success was. I'm not very successful on this one. They don't like me. They don't like me at all. Okay, we got to go. Professor, thank you very much. Yeah.